Well, good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I hope you guys had a really great holiday season. I took the week off last week from creating videos, but I'm back here and I got an interesting project. So right before Christmas, I received a package from Peter Noeth, and he's been interested in some very fascinating alternative photographic techniques that, according to his little essay here, goes all the way back to 1974, which is interesting because that was about the same time that I was working with this material, but in a different fashion. Okay, let me explain. What is it? Well, it is called Blue Line Diazo Paper. Now, these days, of course, if you're into architectural or engineering or mechanical drafting, you're going to be doing it on CAD on a computer and making blueprints printed out on large size printers. But back in those days, in the 1970s, blueprints were made, or I should say blue line prints were made by sandwiching your hand drawing done on usually vellum or sometimes mylar film. You sandwich that on a sheet of what's called diazo paper, which is very similar to cyanotype. It's an iron emulsion, light sensitive to ultraviolet light. The difference between cyanotype and diazo is sanotype is a negative process where the tones get reversed. Wherever light strikes it, it turns dark. Wherever light doesn't strike it, it stays light colored after developing in water. The diazo paper is exposed with UV light in a little printer machine and then it's developed dry using ammonia vapors. So liquid ammonia at room temperature will convert to a gas, ammonia gas, and that's the method for developing diazo paper. So diazo paper or blue line paper is a positive process. So what Peter has been doing since the early 70s is cutting sheets of this paper down and loading them in cameras and making long exposures in the camera to get a direct positive blue image on paper after ammonia vapor developing. And he actually had some honorable mentions in his school photography contest back in the early 70s, which is pretty cool. But lately, he's decided to revisit this. And the challenge of it is, of course, this diazo paper isn't being manufactured anymore, at least not e easily available new, except as new old stock on online auction sites such as eBay. Uh, so what Peter did is he figured out how to pre-flash the paper also, because d diazo paper is really intended to be more of a lithographic kind of a tonal range, just lights and darks and not much of an intermediate grayscale. But we know from experience with pre-flashing paper negatives that you can certainly increase the tonal range, stretch out whatever middle zones of gray there are, you can stretch it out a little bit better by raising the shadows a little bit by pre-flashing before your exposure. I got this package of paper that Peter sent me and I have his essay that's very fascinating that also has some starting recommendations for pre-flashing and exposing and I've been experimenting with it for the last couple weeks on and off. Here is the pre-flashing test strip that Peter did using a compact fluorescent light bulb mounted about 11 inches above the paper. This is in three minute increments. So you can see the left hand most strip is pretty much the dark blue that you see around the border of the film holder. So this is like unexposed. Then the first step of three minutes is probably what you would want to use for the uh, for the proper pre-flash. Although Peter did include a test pr uh, picture that he did where he pre-flashed it for six minutes, so it's going to be equivalent to the second bar here. And here is that image. This is looking out of his garage, his open garage door, to the house across the street. So you can see some light in the sky. The sky is very much blown out to paper white. But what's interesting is there is a little bit of detail here in the trees that I can see. In fact, up in the front here, tree. And there is some kind of a tonal rendition, sort of grayish, going on in this shadow in the foreground of the driveway. And so it looks like it's possible to get some kind of a limited grayscale out of this paper, which is what I'm hoping to achieve. So you can probably see this column here in this house. There is some shading, like from dark to light under the shade of the porch, 
So we can see over on the right side of the picture, adjacent to the driveway, there's a little bit of landscaping, a landscaping cover, like maybe grass, turf of some kind, but it looks like there's a little bit of light uh, kind of grays going on here and darker shadows, so you can sort of distinguish some of the tones there, which is interesting. And also in the landscaping on the other side of the street by the neighbor's house, there's some degree of shading, and of course up on the, the roof line here and along the side of their second floor, it looks like there's some kind of shading that's not just pure paper white or dark blue. So I have hopes that this uh, paper might give us a pretty good tonal range. I chose a slightly different method. I was using, or am using for pre-flashing, this Viltrox uh, battery-powered LED video light panel, and it has a color temperature adjustment, and the bluest that it goes is 5600 Kelvin, so I have it set to 5600 Kelvin. I have mine set to 100% power. There's a power adjustment knob back here. And I did a series of pre-flash tests yesterday and got a good, what looks like a good pre-flash time of about three minutes with the light source set about eight and a half inches away from the paper. This morning, I've set up several test exposures. And so according to Peter's recommendations that out in the bright sunlight, you're going to need several hours of exposure. And he was metering with a Seconic meter starting at an ISO of 6 on the meter. He ended up finding that the correct exposure was 18 stops greater than ISO 6, which amounts to an ISO rating of about 0.00000228 after being pre-flashed. So that ISO number is so low that it really doesn't do you or I any good if you wanted to reproduce his results because no light meter goes that low on ISO. So the only way you can really determine good exposures is, number one, go off the recommendations of other people that have done it. Peter's done it. I'm starting to do it now. But more importantly is test exposures. So that's what I'm doing. I made a few trial runs last week with this paper, and I ended up overexposing the pre-flash because I wasn't actually doing a controlled pre-flash with you know, different increments of time like, like what Peter has done here so well. Um, I did successfully do that yesterday, however. So this is a failed image from last week. So I, I did a pre-flash of 15 minutes using my LED light panel. I was only eight inches away from it. And then I expose this out in my courtyard for an hour and 45 minutes. And it's very difficult to see, but there is this rectangular planter that's in my courtyard. There's a little bit of shade right here, but it's very, very difficult to see. So this is grossly overexposed. Um, actually, the in-camera exposure is pretty close. It's just the pre-flashing was way too bright. But you can see the areas of the film of the paper that weren't pre-flashed and weren't exposed are nice dark blue. Uh, the corner here is where I put some masking tape down for developing it. And when you peel it off, this paper is so thin that it kind of rips it. Okay, this image was a image I did in my backyard. And uh, again, I gave it way too much pre-flashing without any testing. This was three minutes exposed in the direct sunlight. Way too much uh, light. Just totally fogged it. But in between doing the pre-flash exposure and then loading it in the camera and reopening the dark slide, the paper shifted somewhat. So you can see this little sliver right here is pretty well exposed. There's no pre-flashing on it, so the shadows are kind of dark, but you can see the tree branches in the, the back wall here a little bit. Just So this gave me a clue that my two and a half hour exposure was pretty close, but the pre-flashing, I certainly needed to do more in the way of calibrated tests. Okay, so this was my successful pre-flash test using my Viltrox uh, LED light panel set to 100% output, 5600 degree Kelvin. I was seven and a half inches away from the paper, and these were increments of three minutes, and it looks like the three minute exposure is about right on the pre-flash here. So that's what I used for today's experiments. I have two cameras set up right now my 4x5 Intrepid, and my 8x10 box camera. Let's go out and take a look at those setups. So I've 
focused the camera on this scene here. It is about a quarter till 11 in the morning and I'm going to give it about two, two and a half hours exposure. There should be plenty of light throughout the middle of the day for the trees, the shadows on the back wall, etc., the sky behind it to get some kind of an exposure. Okay, so I'm going to pull the dark slide and just open the shutter like that. Set the hour hand onto the timer like that. All right. The next image I'm going to do, I'm going to do it concurrently with the 4x5 one, is I have my 8x10 sliding box camera here. I'm kind of focused on this scene right here, kind of looking at the brightly lit wall behind us, a little bit of that tree in the background. And uh, this lens is a f4.5 Fujinon Xerox machine lens. It does not have a shutter or an aperture adjustment. So we're gonna use the dark slide of the film holder as the shutter since it's gonna be a long exposure. Try not to move the back of the box because it's focus is preset. Make sure the slot, the ridge in the film holder has to be set into the back, which it is now. 15 minutes behind the other exposure. So we'll just set that on top of there. Well, the interesting thing about these Diazo in-camera print exposures is in bright daylight, they're going to take a couple hours. So you kind of have to be set up for the long haul, especially when you're doing experiments like I am and trying to, to get the exposures figured out. It's just a lot of time consuming work. Uh, so I have two cameras set up at once here. I have the 4x5 set up and then now the 8x10. These scenes are not spectacular, they're not fine art, they're just test shots. And we're also challenged by the time of year. Early January, the sun angle is low to the south. We only have uh, a few hours of daylight, at least in the middle of the day when the sun is coming directly from the south a little bit, we have some direct sunlight. So our subject matter is kind of limited. It would probably be more photogenic to photograph the front of my courtyard. It's a little southwestern style architecture, but I don't want to leave my camera out in the driveway for f two or three hours and risk somebody stealing it, and I don't want to sit out there for that long either. But anyway, so we have a backyard scene, two of them, and we'll see what happens. Well, what do you do when you're waiting for your diazo prints to expose? You know, two and a half, three hours? But you got to make some good use of the time. So, especially if you're doing so like you would expect to be doing so in the bright parts of the day. This is a winter day. You know, we have from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, maybe 3 o'clock to get, have bright sun out here. So, now's the time to take advantage of it. It's nice and warm out here. So, uh, you know, sit out here and type, wait for my pictures to expose. Well, it's been about two hours and 15 minutes for the 4x5 picture, and I think I'm going to process it. What I'm going to do is, hopefully without moving the 8x10 camera, I'm going to insert the dark slide and then reassess the 8x10's exposure once I see the results from the 4x5. The difference being, the 8x10 camera is using a faster lens, an f4.5 lens, where this is using an f5.6, so if this turns out to be overexposed, this other one is probably already overexposed, but we'll see. So to develop uh, the diazo paper in ammonia vapors, I take one of these uh, Tupperware-style plastic bins with a lid, and I tape the diazo print on the inside of the lid so the chemical side is facing away from the lid and I'm using an, like an artist tape that doesn't cling too badly. I think a drafting tape would probably work well with this since it is a drafting kind of paper. And then use just a couple ounces of ammonia, household ammonia, in the bottom of the container like that. And then just lay it there face down so the paper is suspended over the ammonia. And you want it to be closer to room temperature so that the ammonia will vaporize. And I just, uh, you know, agitate a little bit just to make sure it's uh, shaken up. And then if you have too much ammonia on one side, maybe one side of the picture develops first. And so I just uh, kind of flip it around halfway through. And I just develop by inspection. It could be 20 minutes, it could be 40 minutes. I just uh, open it up and take a look at it, and then if it's still 
looks like it needs more, I just leave it. You'll know it's properly developed when the yellowish stain on the emulsion goes away. And it's just pure white highlights and dark blue uh, shadows. Well, okay, so this is after, uh, what has it been? It's been about 35 minutes in developing. Now, this is cold out here in my dark room. So ammonia at this temperature stays pretty much in the liquid state. So the vapors it leaves off are a little bit lower than it normally would be in a warmer climate. But anyways, I like it. I'm really happy with it. There are some gray tones in there. I can make out the image. Very cool. Well, this is the 8x10, and obviously the brick wall that I had pointed it at was way overexposed. We got part of the clothesline, the little metal thing in the corner, a little trellis. I like the tree branches up here and the trunk of the uh, tree back here, a little bit of the leaves, uh, the branches, and then the the top of the neighbor's house behind us. But anyways, yeah, it's uh, obviously exposure is very tricky on this process, but hey, we got results. And I like the shadow detail. It looks like the pre-flashing was adequate. It's a little brighter than pure blue on exposed blue behind it here on the edge. So good pre-flash, but too much in-camera exposure. The lens is faster on this camera than the other one, so I should have reduced the exposure. But hey, it does work indeed. So this was the uh, 4x5 exposure on the Intrepid view camera today with the Fujinon 135mm lens wide open at f5.6. And I gotta say, this was really nice results. I was pleasantly surprised at how well it came out. So uh, let's look at it. So the edge of the image around the underneath the border of the film holder, you can see the dark blue. That's as dark as it gets when you develop it with ammonia. And then you can see with my pre-flashing the darkest shadows in the image part itself, like for instance this shaded part of the tree, is lighter in tone than the border. But you can still see some definite or uh, certainly visible tonal differences even in the shadows like for instance this part right here is a little lighter than the left part of the trunk down there and so i was pleasantly surprised with the tones that i got nice and sharp and crisp detail on this uh, tree back here the highlights on the tree trunk right here are probably a little bit overblown and because it was a two and a half hour exposure the shadows of these shrubs were shifting across the wall as the sun went from east to west. So you can see the shadow here looks kind of blurry, and that's just because, again, of the shifting shadows. The uh, foreground tree, you might notice the edge of it looks kind of soft. Well, that because, that's because I focused the camera uh, in the, on the backdrop on the tree itself, on the back, background wall. So this was slightly out of focus. But overall, I was kind of pleased that I do have kind of a grayscale in here. It's not totally just soot and chalk. Uh, this right here, this light uh, part of the wall is definitely overexposed. You really can't see much detail. But uh, that's just the nature of this, uh, c this process, and uh, it does definitely put out contrasty images, but I was pleased with it nonetheless. And oh yeah, these two little pinkish uh, round things, that's when my fingers were wet with water after I took it out of the uh, processing tray and uh, dissolved a little bit of the dye there. But uh, So you've got to handle this stuff with care. And also, the paper is really thin. This is not like photo paper in, in quality or stiffness. It's, it's like uh, letter writing paper. <laughs> it really is. It's pretty thin. So you've got to be take good care of it. Well, I have some final thoughts about this uh, process thus far. I've only begun to play with it, though. Uh, first of all, what do I need to do to make this uh, a better process for me to use? Um, I need to do more pre-flashing experiments using sunlight, both in shade and in direct sun. So when I want to go out somewhere, set up a camera for a couple hours, I can just do the pre-flashing quickly before I start the main exposure. So that's one thing. The second thing is, I really need a better development setup, especially in the winter time, because uh, all the rooms in my house have windows that have sunlight coming in and UV light coming in with it. So it's kind of tricky developing it 
in those situations. I don't want to expose the paper to too much uh, daylight while it's processing. But in the wintertime, my darkroom is cold, so the ammonia is cold. The ammonia doesn't really vaporize well until it's about room temperature. Uh, so I need to get a little light tight tray that I can just bring in here and put the print suspended over it and cover it with something light tight and then I can just do it anytime, anywhere, winter or summer. Uh, so that's just a minor issue. Um, the big challenge though with this process is two things. First of all, the paper is not being made anymore. You can buy new old stock on uh, the uh, online auction sites. Um, I would like to find some larger size than 8x10. I would like to get you know, maybe upwards of uh, 20 by 24 inch would be fun. And then try to make a very simple ultra large format box camera to use it in. But uh, there's a lot of options. I think the main problem though is that you need a fast lens in order to capture enough light, like f5.6 for two and a half hours, right? That is uh, a lot of time for a fast lens even. So you need a, a good wide lens and the challenge is ultra large formats fast lenses are hard to find, right? So perhaps, you know, 8x10 is a good intermediate size because you can get these process lenses like my Xerox lens. It's pretty quick, pretty fast at f4.5, works pretty well, etc. So another thing I'd like to play with is perhaps toning this paper. Uh, it leaves a blue dye kind of color to it and according to what Peter said it is a, a rather light sensitive in the way that you guys remember the old video rental stores that rented movies on VHS and they would leave their little boxes that the movies came in out on the window display maybe and sunlight would hit that and over time there wouldn't be any red left. It would just be bluish green looking labels. You've probably seen that in store displays, right? That some printed material made of dyes, colored dyes, fades with sunlight. So this stuff you need to keep uh, preserved out of the light. It's not light sensitive like silver gelatin emulsion is, but you just want to protect it from the from light for long term archiving. But I would like to experiment, keeping in mind I'm not a chemist, <laughs> but I'd like to experiment with toning this to see if there's any way to make the emulsion more uh, permanent. Like, for instance, the way we selenium tone silver gelatin prints, the silver uh, combines with the selenium to make silver selenide, which causes a slight shift to the warm side, but it also makes that compound a lot more durable and it doesn't tarnish as nearly as easily in, in exposure to oxygen and it's more resistant to contaminants and stuff like that. It would be fun to try to tone this to make it a little bit more permanent. I know that cyanotypes, people do tone cyanotypes with things like tea, black tea, coffee, different things like that. I would like to experiment with it and get something more along a warm tone brownish look rather than bright blue. That would be kind of fun. So that's more experimenting to be done and there's as I said earlier, a lot of experimenting around exposure times for different lighting conditions. I haven't characterized whether there is a reciprocity failure with this. Uh, what are the exposure times going to be like in the summertime versus the winter light? Uh, again, pre-flashing we mentioned. So the problem is a lot of these tests take time because the paper is so slow. And that's really one of the compounded difficulties of working with this process is the data turns. The rate at which you can get new data just takes a long time with it. So in the winter here, in the middle of the day, I have maybe four or five hours of bright light uh, and you have to take advantage of that two and a half hours for an exposure. So you really need a couple cameras set up, you know, at the same time so you can get multiple images made and get more data and more information about how this process works. There was another kind of camera though that I would like to use for this diazo printing method and that is, this is the Jotterman camera and it's made by Jorge Otero Lopez. He sells it on Etsy. He has an Etsy store, uh, Jotterman. So these are little single element lens cameras, fixed focal length, fixed aperture, and they're actually intended to be used as lumen cameras. And the lumen process is putting silver gelatin photo paper 
in the camera, exposing it for a lengthy period of time, and then the, an image forms without chemical development through auto development of the silver halides on the paper. And then the paper remains light sensitive, so you have to like scan it to make an image and then protect it in a dark envelope if you want to preserve it. Uh, but I played around with these. This particular camera has about a quarter inch aperture and roughly a two inch focal length, so it's roughly f8. So it's a little bit slower than the, the lenses I'm using today for the diazo process, so you'd probably want to be using one of these for four to six to maybe eight hours of daylight to get uh, a proper exposure. But it's a very interesting camera that is also useful for just setting out for hours in a landscape and making these diazo landscape pictures. So this is another of these alternative photographic processes. They're not as convenient as snapping a digital photo or using regular film, black and white or color, or even photo paper. In comparison to photo paper, this stuff is really, really slow and it's, it's more difficult to work with. But having the advantage of having worked with paper negatives and Harman direct positive paper and the black and white reversal process I've done before, it does make it a little bit easier to work with this and to get results. And so I encourage you guys, if you're interested in this process, go online and buy some Diazo paper, which is blue line paper developed in regular household ammonia and stick it in a large format camera, open that lens wide up and stick it out there in the sun in a sunny scene and try your hand at it or get an old box camera somewhere and try it. This sounds fun to me. Well, this is Joe, and I encourage you, do things like this. Stay active, stay busy with experimenting with photographic processes. It sure is a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And until next time, have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.